the temporal vision is studied with stimuli uh, of which luminance varies over time and the study of temporal vision uh, concerns how we perceive changes in luminance over time so if the pattern of luminance um, follows the sine wave function then it is called a temporal sinusoid however um, be careful not to imagine a previous sine wave gratings you have seen in the spatial vision um, even though these stimuli are the temporal equivalent of spatial sine wave gratings but they don't necessarily look like a sine wave grating um, while a spatial grating manifests a sinusoidal change in luminance across space a temporal sinusoid manifests a sinusoidal change in luminance over time which appears to be a flickering light, a flickering light so they're defined by temporal contrast or depth of modulation and that's what they call sometimes and temporal frequency so the visibility of a temporally modulated stimulus is related to its depth of modulation and this graph shows luminous profile of a stimulus of which luminance is temporally modulated um, and sinusoidally over time so here a um, refers to the um, amplitude of modulation right so um and then this graph shows another luminance profile of a temporal sinusoid with larger modulation depth but the uh, waveform is undulating over the same average luminance so this dotted line is representing the um the average luminance um so this has the same average luminance as the previous one now um, just as it is possible to vary the frequency of a spatial grating it is also possible to vary the frequency of a temporal sinusoid so a low temporal frequency stimulus is seen as flickering at low rate uh, whereas a higher temporal frequency stimulus flickers at a higher rate so here is an example of temporal sinusoid modulated at a relatively low temporal frequency and this is an example of temporal sinusoid modulated at a relatively higher temporal frequency now we can see that there are a more cycles in unit time with high temporal frequency and the unit of temporal frequency is hertz named after german physicist heinrich hertz and it is it, it expresses how many flickers uh, how many flicker cycles are contained in a second okay so what i'm going to show you right now is a couple of um, example and um, stimulus of temporal sinusoids so i wrote a program to actually run this uh, temporal sinusoid so i'm going to start with um very slow undulating temporal sinusoid with high contrast. Okay, so did you see the um, the temporal sinusoid? So you can see that um, the stimulus is actually the two-dimensional Gaussian and that the contrast the luminance profile of that two-dimensional Gaussian changes um, following the uh, the sine wave function in time so it doesn't look like a sine wave grating uh, as we have seen in the spatial vision right it is only um, the, the luminous profile of that two-dimensional Gaussian um, that follows the sine wave function not the stimulus itself okay so now i'm going to show you a little bit faster temporal sinusoid with five hertz and then half of the contrast compared to the previous one 
And finally, um, another temporal sinusoid with 10 hertz with 10% contrast. Okay, so I hope you now understand what temporal sinusoid look like. Um, in fact, the last one with the 10 hertz and 10% contrast, um, I think there was um, some sort of artifact, so uh, it was not really accurately presented. But um, now I think you get the um, you know the idea uh, about the uh, the temporal sinusoid. So just as the uh, visual system sums the light across a spatial area, um, the visual system also sums light collected over time. So when the light level is limited, long integration time is preferred for detection, whereas a short integration time is preferred for the uh, fine temporal discrimination when there is enough light. So temporal summation is the ability to sum the light over time, whereas temporal resolution is the, um, the ability to resolve two events of light occurring in temporal succession. And the critical duration or period is the time period over which light is summed. And we have two different critical durations depending upon um, you know, which visual system kicks in to um, try to sum, uh, try to um, perform the uh, temporal summation. So um, photopic system has very short critical duration window um, between like a 10 to 50 milliseconds, whereas scotopic system has um, a wider window, wider time window to summate the light. So it's between 100 to 200, uh, 200 milliseconds. So no matter how many flashes fall within the critical duration, they will be seen as one. So as long as um, these flashes fall within the critical duration period, then they will get all summated as uh, one. So in order for two flashes to be temporally resolved as two, then they must be separated in time by at least a critical duration. So, um, so here is an illustration of um, scotopic temporal summation, and this will show you in how our visual system reaches threshold in time. So let's say, for example, um, the critical duration for the scotopic vision is 150 milliseconds as uh, presented here, right? So let's just assume that this is the temporal summation window for the uh, scotopic system. Right. And the number of quanta to reach threshold is constant, which is represented by this dotted line. So what I'm going to do is to show you a flash of light represented by a vertical um, thin line. So like this or that. So this is a subthreshold light, subthreshold flash, whereas this one is super threshold, right? Because the energy actually goes over uh, the threshold light intensity, right? And I'm going to show you like flash in succession, and it's going to be, it's going to be very fast. So um, just um, focus and see if you can follow those flashes. Um, Right, so you're ready? So here. Okay, so I'm going to do this again. So flash to flash. Right. So um, this time, the two lights, um, the light intensities are about like two thirds of the threshold intensity. And then they were flashed in time, separated by more than 100 milliseconds. Then these two flashes won't be summated and uh, as a consequence no flash will be seen by the system 
right? But however, so there's a, another illustration. Okay, so I'll just do this again. Okay, this time, <laughs> now two flashes with the same light intensity, two thirds of the threshold intensity have flashed one after the other within the critical duration of 100 milliseconds. Then a flash, one flash will be detected because um, their subthreshold intensities are added up. And now the summed intensity becomes greater than the threshold light intensity. Now, <clears throat> let's look at what happens if two lights with a super threshold intensity, um, one after the other, within the critical period. So now, watch out. Do this again. Okay, so even though, you know, these two flashes are super threshold, uh, flashes because they fall within this critical summation period um, the visual system will only be able to see one flash instead of two flashes okay so there's still one flash and so I'll show you this again so how about now so um now one light uh, with a super threshold flashes and the other light with the same intensity after 200 milliseconds right and so i think it was actually flash at 250 yeah so after 200 milliseconds then how many flashes will be seen now it is two because and the second flash is subject to the next summation period, right? So now this system can see two flashes of light. Now, this is for the uh, photopic um, temporal summation. As you can see, um, the summation window is much narrower, right? So this is basically the same demonstration. But, if, um, so, okay, hope you saw that, but I'll do this again. So, how many flashes this time? No flash, right? Because, you know, one flash was sub-threshold, fall within the critical period, and the other one with the same... Um, intensity, which is a two thirds of the uh, threshold, um, flashed outside of this time window, so they won't get summated over. Um, so uh, it never reaches the um, the threshold light intensity, so no flash will be seen. Okay, more time. Okay, so now. Um, and one flash will be seen because they fall within um, the critical period, the, the critical period, right? The summation period. So, um, so the two two thirds of uh, a threshold line intensity falls within the critical period. So they will be summated to signal one light flash event. And the next one. Again, All right again, the system will only see one flash, right? Because um, they will be just summated um, because they fall within the summation period. And finally, two flash will be seen, two flashes will be seen because um, they're all both super threshold um, light flashes one fall within one falls within the uh, summation period and the other falls outside the critical period so um there will be a uh, two flashes signaled for this visual system so this is another way to compare um the temporal summation and resolution um
between the photopic and the scotopic system. So as you can see, um, the time window for summation uh, is quite different between the photopic vision and scotopic vision. So photopic vision has a very narrow um, time window for summation, whereas scotopic system has a much wider window for summation. So let's say uh, there were two flashes um, over time. So let's just assume that the size, the intensity of each flash are a sub-threshold. Okay? So for the photopic vision, um, so one flash actually falls within the critical duration and the other is outside of the critical duration. So the net result is you know, two flash um, uh, that is uh, two flashes that are detected. On the other hand, when the same um, two consecutive flashes fall um, in the um, the scotopic system, then these two flashes will be summated because um, the window of summation um, for scotopic vision is much wider. So the net result will be a single flash detected. So the time intensity reciprocity and this block slow. So um, this is a relationship between the time and light intensity. Um, and we actually talked about this block slow before when we talk about uh, the, uh, the HECT experiment, right? To measure the absolute threshold of um, light, right? And so the Bloch's law um, states that within the critical duration, the total number of quanta needed to reach threshold remains the same, uh, which basically expressed in this um, an equation, simple equation. So K is constant, and I represent intensity of light, T is the duration of light. So basically, Within this critical duration, which is a scotopic critical duration, it is the basically the area um, of this square, right? So this is a threshold light intensity. And then, so the, within the critical duration, um, the intensity and duration are inversely proportional. So in other words, they are reciprocal. They have a reciprocal relationship. So, for example, when the luminance is halved, a doubling in stimulus duration is required to reach threshold. On the other hand, when luminance is doubled, then the threshold can be reached in half the duration. And beyond the critical duration, threshold is only dependent upon luminance rather than the product of luminance and duration. So, um, this relationship is shown on the graph here in case of scotopic vision. So basically it is the same, but you know, photopic critical duration is much um, shorter. So in the spatial domain, spatial vision was characterized by the contrast sensitivity function. So to study how the visual system perceives changes in luminance over time, we need to test the eye with temporal sinusoids with various contrast and temporal frequencies. So this leads to the concept of a temporal contrast sensitivity function, uh, which plots the limits of our ability to perceive flicker as the stimulus varies in terms of temporal contrast and frequency. In many respects, um, spatial contrast sensitivity function and the temporal contrast sensitivity function are very similar. So in the left panel, contrast thresholds are plotted against the temporal frequency. And on the y-axis, high values represent high modulation, whereas low values represent low modulation. So modulation here means the temporal contrast. And in spatial vision, high contrast uh, is always easier to see than low contrast, and it is the same for the uh, temporal vision. And all the modulation values above the threshold curve, right? So here, um, 
represents the modulation that can be seen and the curve uh, represents the lowest modulation that can be seen so this is the boundary values the lower boundary right um so stimulus with modulation values below the curve right cannot be detected cannot be resolved and flicker is not seen and the screen will appear steady and on the right uh, we have a typical temporal contrast sensitivity function now the y-axis is the inverse of the contrast threshold right so we talked about this in the uh, spatial contrast sensitivity function so threshold contrast threshold and sensitivity is just a you know straight reciprocal relationship so um so the high values uh, on the right um re uh, represents uh, represent the low temporal contrast um, and the low values low sensitivity uh, represents high contrast and high sensitivity means low contrast and sensitivity values corresponding to the area under the curve uh, represent the range of flicker and contrast values that, per that the person can see and sensitivity values above um, the flicker of the curve um, represent stimuli for which flicker is not visible so in this region the flicker will appear steady um, like in um, spatial contrast sensitivity function peak sensitivity occurs at mid-range temporal frequencies but is worse at lower and higher um, temporal frequencies so our eyes appear to be most sensitive to, sensitive to temporal frequencies range from like you know 10 to 20 hertz in photopic condition and the highest temporal frequency that a person can resolve is indicated by the extreme right value on the temporal and contrast sensitive function curve this is referred to as the critical flicker fusion frequency and denoted with arrow so this is a a temporal counterpart to the um, high spatial uh, cutoff frequency in spatial contrast sensitivity function. So, um, you know, the psychophysical determination of the temporal contrast sensitivity function is basically the same as how you determine the spatial contrast sensitivity function um, in uh, psychophysically. So uh, I'm not going to just bore you with go over the steps again. So this is just a, basically the uh, the simplified um, you know temporal contrast sensitive function of a normal observer, which looks similar to the um, um, contrast sensitive function in spatial domain so um, now this x-axis represents hertz temporal frequency so that's hertz cycles per second right and here we have 100 again and that's just contrast sensitivity, right? So, and this is just a resolved vision on so right? And the peak is about 10 to 20 hertz. And this is a critical fluke refusion, which is about um, 60 hertz. Okay, so um, this actually corresponds to the um, the uh, monitors. Um, what is that thing called? Refresh rate, refresh rate, right. So 
the monitor, so the typical commercial monitors actually flickers at 60 hertz. So that is basically the um, um, the limits of the human temporal vision, basically. So if something flickers over 60 hertz, then we cannot really see um, that is moving. All right. I mean, for some sensitive people, um, they can still see the flicker at 60 hertz. So now if you just see like a gaming monitors these days, it goes up to 75, 144 hertz. So basically just to double up the um, critical flicker fusion to um, provide a more smooth um, visual experience, basically. So um, the critical flicker fusion frequency is analogous to high spatial frequency cutoff in spatial contrast sensitivity function. So as the frequency of a spatial grating is increased, it appears to um, consist of increasingly thin bars, right? Likewise, as the frequency of a temporally modulated stimulus is increased, then the flicker appears more rapid um, as we have seen before, you know, from those uh, temporal sinusoids. And in the case of spatial contrast sensitivity function, the bars were not resolvable at high at the high spatial frequency cutoff, and the stimulus appears as a uniform gray surface, right? And the frequencies eventually reach that um, reach it to the point where um, they, they cannot be resolved and the stimulus appears steady. So um, this temporal frequency, um, the um, critical frequency fusion represents the high temporal resolution limit of the visual system for a given contrast. So it can be thought of as a temporal acuity. So when we refer to the critical flicker fusion, we usually mean the high contrast critical flicker fusion, like in high spatial frequency cutoff in spatial contrast sensitivity function. However, if you are using a lower contrast flicker, then the critical flicker fusion could refer to either the lowest or the highest flicker detectable. So there are a number of factors affecting the value of critical flicker fusion, such as uh, modulation depth, um, in other words, temporal contrast, background illumination, or eccentricity, um, because of the, uh, the different um, distribution of rods and cones. So for example, temporal contrast and steady function changes with increasing retinal illumination. And in general, sensitivity increases with greater retinal illumination across range of temporal frequencies. So here we have three temporal contrast sensitivity functions for uh, three different background retinal illuminations ranging from um, 10 to 1000, so ranging two orders of magnitude. So here, um, uh, there's a three orders, sorry, three orders of magnitude. And here the, uh, the troll end uh, is a conventional unit to um, denote uh, the retinal illuminance and the bigger the number, the bigger number represents brighter retinal illuminance. And note that uh, increasing illumination has a smaller effect on the sensitivity at lower temporal frequencies, right? and it um, enhances high temporal frequency sensitivity. So if we plot the critical flicker fusions, um, the points where the red circle is enclosing as a function of retinal illuminance, then we obtain the following graph. So um, if we plot the uh, critical flicker fusion as a function of log retinal illumination, then the critical flicker fusion increases linearly as log retinal illumination increases over four log units, uh, log units with the full view observation. So from negative two, 
negative 2 to positive 2, so this region, right? So this is where the Ferry portal law um, is applied. So um, it is expressed that, that the law is expressed as the equation shown here, right? Where K is the slope of line and the L, big L, represents the luminance and B is a constant. Because the um, critical flicker fusion is different for rod, uh, rods and cones, um, the uh, critical flicker fusion will change depending on the proportion of rods and cones being stimulated. Because the proportion of rods and cones change with uh, changes with ex eccentricity, a Fourville test stimulus will follow the Ferry Portal law and show no kink. So there will be just an one branch. So that is this purple um, curve is actually showing, right? So this is a kind of a full area uh, where the uh, fair, um, the ferry portal law uh, applies. Um, because in, in full area, in, in, in fovea, only cones are present. So um, the curve at zero, zero eccentricity is the same as the one that was shown in the previous slide. But uh, an extra fovel test stimuli will now show a kink, so two branches in the critical flicker fusion function, because the rods now determine the critical flicker fusion at low retinal illuminances, and the cones at determining um, the critical flicker fusion at higher retinal illuminance. So note that the Ferry Portal law applies over a decreasing range as the eccentricity increases and the temporal resolution becomes poorer for eccentric locations. For example, the linear part of the curve at the 15 degrees of eccentricity uh, can only be found from 0 to, say, uh, 1.5 log units, right? So um, as the uh, eccentricity increases, um, the ferry portal law now breaks down. Again, because of the different population of rods and cones in the retina and different spatial summation properties, the critical flicker fusion will be dependent upon the area of the retina being stimulated. So instead of a varying retinal eccentricity as before, now the size of the centrally fixated test field is varied here. So as the test field increases, two branches begin to appear. The lower left branch um, representing the rod function. So here the, um, the granular Harper law is uh, this relationship between the critical flicker fusion and uh, the, uh, the area of the stimulus. So if you just cut um, these lines at a certain retinal illuminance and then plot um, these critical flicker fusion frequencies as a function of the size of um, the stimulus, then you will get this linear relationship again, um, which is the granular Harper law. So the critical flicker fusion is a function of the slope of the line and then log of the area, and B is again the constant. So far, we have seen the phenomena related to high temporal frequencies, but um, you know, like in the spatial contrast sensitivity function, and we also have decreased sensitivity at low temporal frequency region. And in fact, there are quite a few interesting phenomena related to the decreased sensitivity at low temporal, temporal frequencies in human. So it seems that we are very insensitive to slow moving objects or static images. For example, our day and night cycle can be considered as a very low, a very, very slow flicker of light, which completes a cycle in 24 hours. In this case, we really don't sense the change in luminance uh, in time. So, and there are other related phenomena such as 
stabilized retinal images such as percunia tree and fading of static image called Troxler's effect. So this, this picture shows the inside of our eyes covered with blood vessels. And the pattern of blood vessels as shown in this picture is called the Purkinia tree after the Bohemian physiologist who first described it. Um, obviously, some of the blood vessels will be in the way of fovea, blocking the light and casting shadow on the surface of the retina. Nonetheless, we do not see these blood vessels in normal everyday visual activities. Um, the reason why we do not see these blood vessels has to do with the way our visual system ignores the objects without any motion contrast. So these blood vessels are fixed forever with respect to the retina. So um, in other words, as you move your eye around, uh, they move around together, forming a fixed relationship. So the pattern of retinal blood vessels does not change even if you move your eye. So in a pattern like this, uh, one uh, that is fixed with respect to your retina, uh, even um, as the uh, position of your eye changes is called a stabilized image, and our eyes is uh, our eyes are uh, very, well, uh, insensitive to uh, these uh, stabilized images. So here is another phenomenon called Troxler's effect, uh, showing how quickly our sensitivity wanes uh, when an object ceases to move within our visual field. So Troxler's effect is the um, kind of temporary and irregular fading or disappearance of a small object in the visual field during a state of fixation of another object. So as an example, if you stare at the black dot in the middle for a while, then the edges of the gray region will quickly fade away from the view, which is a classic Troxler's effect. However, if a dotted line is placed like this, um, then the dotted line uh, won't disappear. The reason um, is uh, because uh, you know, when we are fixating on something static, we have a constant involuntary and tiny eye movements called the microsaccades. So this microsaccades, in effect, creates a tremble in our retinal image like a flicker. However, the changes in contrast of the background are so gradual that it does not produce noticeable contrast difference with microsaccades. However, the sharp boundary against the fading background creates a big enough contrast difference uh, that can be picked up by the microsaccades and work like a temporal flicker. So um, I have uh, shown you this before, right? Uh, from the beginning of the lecture, this is a combination of Troxler's effect and opponent theory of color called a lilac chaser. So in this example, um, the blue static spots will fade away after several seconds when you fix it on the black cross for a while. And this leaves only a gray background and the fixation cross which is a classic uh, Troxler's effect, and they will reappear when you move your fixation or blink. So on top of the uh, Troxler's effect, you might be able to experience an appearance of a moving yellow spot. Uh, this is because your photoreceptor sensitive to blue becomes tired after watching them for a while, and the photoreceptors sensitive to uh, opponent color, which is yellow becomes relatively more sensitive. So you see this um, yellow spot moving around uh, the places where it is actually neutral gray.